As president of the Middle States Commission on Higher Education, it's my privilege to share with you this important message about the work of the commission over the past year and provide some remarks on what to expect with us this coming fiscal year. I would like to begin by thanking you all for the exceptional work that you do on behalf of students. Thank you for your commitment to student-centered accreditation. We continue to see the many ways peer review and accreditation works, and we appreciate all that everyone contributes to our rigorous processes. Let me share some reflections on our membership. We continue to see institutions reaching out to the commission with interest in our accreditation. This could be because of changing state requirements or simply because institutions have more choices than ever before in terms of their accreditation. It is clear to me as part of this work though, that our reputation stands on its own merits. With the changes in regulation, the Commission continues to evaluate what the process for new institutions should look like and when the process should allow institutions to move more quickly. Institutions are coming to us in good standing from other recognized accreditors, and they deserve to have that standing honored with a more efficient and expedient process with us. The Commission endorsed a new pathway at our June meeting for these very institutions, and more information will be forthcoming soon. Of course, we are seeing other changes contributing to fluctuations in our membership. Institutions consider new relationships, potential mergers, acquisitions, and other kinds of transactions that fall into our definition of complex substantive change. These kinds of transactions often result in one or more institutions no longer being independently accredited with us, technically a loss in our membership. But these transactions continue to be vital and our processes and our expertise lend to assisting institutions with exploring and implementing these kinds of significant changes. Contact us early and often so we can best position you and your team for alignment with regulatory expectations. From July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024, the commission expected 12 institutions to leave the membership. These reflect any number of items, including mergers or other kinds of transactions, changes in accreditors, the voluntary surrender of accreditation, approved closures, and unapproved closures. Since unapproved institutional closures are by far the most concerning due to the impact on students, I want to reiterate commission expectations. Institutional leaders and governing boards must be transparent with the commission and with the constituents they serve. Any and all changes must be done with integrity. We understand that institutions face tough choices, but the right direction will always be guided by and grounded in the option that best serves students. The commission always stands at the ready to help institutions close with integrity, a basic requirement we hold for all closing institutions. Commission staff are positioned to properly advise institutions how best to approach a closure and the considerations required for faculty and staff, and most importantly, for students. As a reminder, we continue to have vice president liaisons assigned to each institution, and that is by design to offer advice and an opportunity for the most candid of conversations about the status of the institution. As you consider the future sustainability of your institutions, know that you have no better source of advice and information than the Commission's staff. I remind you that you owe your constituents and us the gift of time in circumstances of closure, and we can help you use that time you do have most wisely. In an effort to protect the integrity of closures, our commission has now defined the only kind of closure that we can approve as sitting at a minimum of six months notice. 
Well, we prefer that institutions plan in advance even beyond six months. Any closure at or less than six months will be designated as unapproved and will be subjected to a different process than those that are done with sufficient notice. This is what sits at the heart of our commitment to ethics and integrity. We all have a responsibility to put ourselves at the forefront of standard two, ethics and integrity. And we must lean into our standards and requirements when times may be toughest. Students deserve better. While many of our institutions are impressively stepping up to serve as teach out partners with little or no notice, we all prefer to provide students with as much time and as much good information as is possible when students face the significant academic disruption that closure brings. Boards and institutional leaders owe it to constituents to pay attention to their data, financial and otherwise, be honest and brave in decision-making, put students at the heart of decisions, and contact us for the best support and advice. You may have seen the news that I now serve as chair of the Council of Regional Accrediting Commissions, or CRAC. I'm excited about this opportunity, despite the challenges that sit with the higher education community. This is an important time to carry our critical voices and perspectives as we consider significant federal and state policy positions, regulatory changes, and other increasingly complex political environments influencing higher education. Our commission will continue to share advocacy opportunities heading into this fall. We are committed to leveraging our voices together in ways that are meaningful. And we encourage you to pay close attention to the many policy shifts that impact you, your students, your communities, and the work at your institutions. I want to shift gears and focus on particular processes of the commission, in particular, the annual institutional update, supplemental information reports, and self-study visits. The commission has continued to innovate in order to better serve our institutions and the public. This has included our efforts to streamline the annual institutional update, or the AIU. The Commission re-evaluated the 2024 AIU, as you know, and began to better utilize public data as part of this process. The new format made data available through a dashboard for verification and streamlined this process to lessen data reporting burdens on institutions, saving significant time and resources that had to be invested in this required monitoring activity. In the fall, the Commission will seek information from our non-IPEDS institutions. This fiscal year, we plan to leverage the AIU data across all accreditation activities, and we know that institutions will continue to reflect upon the data and leverage it in decision making. I also want to address another monitoring activity for the Commission, requests for supplemental information reports. We appreciate that we are asking more of you, often through these requests. Some of this is required by federal regulation, while other circumstances require us to better understand the status of an issue at your institution. Rest assured that we continue to reflect upon the many ways we engage with you. We know that you understand the environment is expecting more of us and in turn, more of you. This does not change our commitment to serving you and your institutions as best we can as partners in this work and as advocates for all of us. Now I would like to focus on the process of self-study. Thank you to our many institutions who hosted a self-study visit this past year. We enjoyed learning more about the innovative practices at your institutions through the on-site evaluation teams.
We recognize the efforts that every institution must put forward during self-study, and we are most appreciative of all that you give. I want to draw attention to the fact that we will be focusing on expanding the number of institutions that host fall visits. New approaches to the timing of self-study activities are critical to better balance the number of visits taking place during any particular year. This will help us with team management and allow us to most appropriately spread the work of over 60 institutions in self-study at any one time. We also know there has been a thirst to enter Self-Study Institute earlier, and this will support the planning of fall visits as well. Many institutions have hosted a successful on-site evaluation visit in the fall, and we will be looking to you in upcoming cohorts to move away from spring and host a team visit during the fall instead. As we continue to evaluate changes in our accreditation process, we thank you for the many ways you've adjusted to the changes while ensuring a focus on what the Commission has needed from you and your institutions. As noted in the communication sent to you with the annual dues invoice for this fiscal year, the Commission's dues and fees for fiscal year 2025 will reflect an overall dues increase of 3%. The impact on institutions will range from $57 for our smallest institution and a maximum of $1,191 for the largest institution. This year, we are also thrilled to present a new fee structure that is intended to be more inclusive and reflect clarity across fees charged for accreditation activities. You will see that fees now include honoraria without separate billing, new inclusive fees for self-study evaluation and the on-site evaluation visit, changes to fees within the substantive change section, and new fees to account for the voluntary surrender of accreditation, which also includes a fee for any institution that attempts closure with less than six months notice. Please outreach to us with any questions you may have about the changes to the fees. Hopefully, you will find the new structure responsive to your questions of the past and reflective of a better way to present the fees that you can expect as part of your accreditation activities with us. As you plan your year, please join us for our virtual webinars and at our annual conference. This year, the conference will be held on Wednesday, December 11th through Friday, December 13th, and we hope to see you again in Philadelphia. We always enjoy seeing you at this premier event where nearly 1,500 of us gather to discuss critical issues and share meaningful approaches to all that we do in support of the student experience and student success. We are especially proud of your students who have joined us at the conference to present their research through student poster presentations. To my knowledge, we remain the only institutional accreditor incorporating students into our conference in this way. And hosting nearly 100 students last year was an honor we hope to replicate again this year. I want to end where I began, and that is with expressions of appreciation. I want to thank each and every accreditation liaison officer for your dedication and all that you do to support the work of accreditation throughout the year. As you know, our policies and procedures require an individual to be designated as the ALO. These individuals serve as such a critical conduit between us and our institutions and the service of the ALO is truly unmatched, impressive, and often underappreciated. I want to mention the ALO and thank those of you serving in this role because you continue to prove how valuable you are to us and to each of our institutions. I also want to acknowledge the work of all other leaders at our institutions. Your constant and persistent focus on helping colleagues, students, 
and communities navigate turbulent and challenging times has not gone unnoticed by the commission. We often reflect on the ways that leaders sit at the core of our work and the work of our institutions, and we thank you. Many of you serve as peer evaluators for us, and our committee meetings with our team chairs and vice chairs remind us each and every year how grateful we are to those who give so generously to us and to our institutions. We cannot do the work of accreditation without the service and contributions of all of our peer evaluators. And we thank you for the many ways you enhance the excellence across institutions. We appreciate that you are proud to be affiliated with the Middle States Commission on Higher Education. And I am most proud to lead this esteemed organization and represent the institutions within our membership. I also want to recognize our 27 commissioners whose dedication to the work of accreditation inspires excellence in higher education through decisions that leave an impressive imprint on our membership. These individuals work tirelessly to ensure that our multi-level decision-making process results in outcomes that reflect rigor. Their dedication to quality is evident through all of their contributions at every level of decision-making. Finally, none of us can do this work without the staff of the commission. I want to thank them as well and reiterate that I remain proud of the ways that we continue to contribute to our institutions and the many ways that all of the staff feel honored to do this work and to serve all of you. When challenges arise, remember that we remain dedicated to offer support, so never hesitate to outreach to us. I will conclude by sharing that our commission will host strategic planning efforts this year. We look forward to demonstrating our own commitment to reflection, renewal, and organizational improvement to ensure that we continue to meet important goals for ourselves and for you, those we serve. We know we always have ways to enhance what we do to best serve those engaged with us and our work. At a time of new demands and changing expectations, creating a strategic vision for us beyond 2025 will position us for the many ways that modern accreditation remains a lever for institutional quality and student success. Thank you for accompanying us along this journey and contributing to our future. On behalf of the commission, please know that we are most appreciative of all that you give and we hope you enjoy an amazing summer. <laughs>